It's okay to sit there now yeah. with yeah. your current net worth and go, I'm not in this for the money. Do you know what I mean? Do you think we took our eye off the ball? Because I know how I feel about this. 100%. There was so much that we missed. When you and me first met, you were more typically what I would expect a young lad who'd made some good money to be. Steve sold chairs as part of this, Paul sold chairs as part of this. Was that a conscious thing that you wanted them to do or sort of asked them to do? I think people had an idea as to where they wanted to, what, how much they wanted to sell. The only thing that did come from left, left field was the fact that Lewis also wanted to sell all of his shareholding. And to be honest, I had no idea that he would want to do that. I really want to elevate this brand. I really want to take it up a notch onto that next level. What are you more fearful of? Nike, Adidas, under Armour, Lululemon, etc. Or the next 19 year old kid in the garage. Yeah, you know the answer to that all day long. Have you got one billion pounds in your bank account? See, if, if this was a normal Ben Francis vlog, this would have not made it in. <laughs> Edit this out, Perrot. So a few months ago, me and Noel recorded a podcast that was about all things Gymshark, how it started and the journey to where we, well, where we were a few months ago. Now, since then, so much has changed. The news has come out that Gymshark is now a, you know, a one plus billion dollar brand. So me and Noel have gotten together, albeit remotely via Zoom, to talk again about all things Gymshark and particularly what has been going on in the last six months. So I'm gonna do my best to do, uh, do my Joe Rogan slash True Geordie impression. Speaking of which, you did the True Geordie podcast recently, Ben. What was that like? That was good. Um... So we went down, that was only, it was only, was it last week? I think it was last week or the week before. Went down to London. I mean, we'd, I'd already met Brian and Lawrence before. So it, it was cool to see them again. I won't lie, I was pretty nervous going into it. Uh, it's, it's a bit weird. Like you walk in, right? And then there's, you know, it's in their apartment. So you walk in and then there was like, you know, cameras on sort of on rails. There was a load of people there. Um, to sort of help them out with the production of it. So it was definitely nerve wracking, but it was really good. It was really good fun to chat to them. And it was cool because they sort of came at it from a slightly different angle than what a lot of conversations in the past have been around. So yeah, it was really good fun to be honest. When I watched it back, what I liked about it was the fact I feel like I saw you being you, like the, the you that I interact with. We're like, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna kill the fantasy for you, some of your subs now, but you don't always talk the way you do on YouTube. Do you know what I mean? Like, whereas Brian and Lawrence seem to be able to make you a bit more comfortable. I think that's what the last podcast that we did together, why that sort of worked as well is, I felt like the normal you coming out a little bit, so hopefully we can do a bit more of that today, but yeah. The, pro the process of becoming an official unicorn, obviously like, well, the unicorn thing for those who don't know is just a byproduct of having a valuation over a billion dollars, right? But we never we never had a reason to have like a strict valuation before did we it was the investment that caused that so the investment is the real thing to talk about here i feel like but how do you even get started on a process like that like when you've got you know company like jim shark the majority shareholder all that kind of stuff how do you arrive at the decision to say yes i'm going to bring in in finance i'm going to get somebody else on board and you know uh but t talk to us around that a little bit so so for me so if we go back like a few years um just before Paul and Steve came on board to Steve's chief exec, Paul's the, the chairman, and, and they really helped elevate Jim Sharp from the proper entrepreneur, entrepreneurial nuts and bolts stage into being more of a, of a conventional business. The decision making for bringing an investor on board was very much similar to the decision making in terms of bringing Paul and Steve on board. Um, and both times it's been a case of, right, I really want to elevate this brand. I really want to take it up a notch onto that next level. Um, what's the best way of doing that? So back in the day, it was bringing on Paul and Steve in terms of their knowledge and experience, and they would, were essentially filling gaps where I was you know, very, very weak. About 12 months before we actually completed on the deal, probably a bit more than that, with, um, with General Atlantic, we sat down and we, we thought to ourselves, if we're going to truly elevate Gymshark into a global brand and move on um, and become the next level brand that we really want to become, um, we knew that we'd need some help. Um, I thought I think we we felt like our our sort of approach to Europe we we understood fairly well. Um, our approach to North America I thought we did okay. I think we've done okay on, albeit we could definitely do with support there. We've already seen since GA have been to the business how much they can help in that respect. But in terms of the sort of Asia Asia Pac region, I'm going to be first to say we haven't got a clue how to approach that market and how to really grow there. Um, so yeah, we wanted we wanted to become a truly global brand that it made sense to bring someone on board that really understood that. Um, as a side note, there was the, you know, the shareholding sort of bits that ended up changing, which makes the business a lot more efficient and a lot easier to run, particularly from my point of view as well. Um, but at the time it was just, how can we really fuel our global expansion, um, aspirations? And when you talk about the next level, I feel like it's, you and me can understand what we mean by that, but to give, 
the subscribers and the listeners and whatever else, that, some context. Who do you see as at that next level right now? Who do you, who, in this next stage of growth, who do you want us to become as big as or bigger than or whatever? So I'm, to be honest, I'm less fussed about size as such, but I want to become a global brand that's built in the right way. The ob- obvious names, Lulu, Nike, Under Armour, those sorts of brands are obviously up there and they're doing brilliant, brilliant things. Um, we, like I said, we started off as an entrepreneurial brand and then we professionalized heavily and it, it has been brilliant and it's been great for us. It's been great for the consumer and the community and we've grown rapidly since doing that. But like I said, now where the business is at, there's a whole new set of problems. We've got offices in Hong Kong, in Mauritius, we're opening up in Dem- Denver, Colorado, we're opening up distribution centers around the world. Previously, they were all within Europe. So um, the business is just growing arms and legs. So it's, um, it's a completely new set of challenges that I've never faced before and being completely candid that the rest of the, you know, the leadership team have never faced before. So yeah, it's, um, it's a very interesting few years ahead that we've got. And was the, the process of bringing GA on, albeit like you said, you had your reasons and obviously they were the right reasons, but that, that can't take away from the fact that it must've been a scary process right, to, 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 to do some real sort of big business, if you want to call it that. Yeah. It was, I mean, it was a massive learning curve. I learned so much. I mean, I know you were on, on the vast majority of it. You learned loads as well. Everyone on the board, and to be honest, pretty much everyone in the business learned so much going through it. And I would say, coming out of it, I know more about the Gymshark business, community, everything than I ever have in my life. By the yeah, end of it, I could, I could recite to you our full data strategy as well as our financial strategy, as, long, as well as our brand strategy. And that's, that's never been something that I've been able to do before. And I know you felt exactly the same as we went through it as well. So yeah, I mean, I learned a load in that respect. I learned just how these deals go through, how they work. I learned the pros and the cons. I learned about the things that the, the, the things I needed to do p- to protect myself. I knew, you know, how to interact and work with, you know, this sort of new group of people that I'd never worked with before. Um, so yeah, it was, it was weird. And it, I learned how to well and truly spin a lot of plates at once as well, which was, which was interesting because whilst all this is going on, and by the way, doing a deal is more than a full-time job in itself, whilst also having to run the Gymshark business and grow the Gymshark business at the rate that we were, that was very, very tough. Do you think we took our eye off the ball? Cause I know how I feel about this, but do you think 100%. in terms of the, the Gymshark business, do you think we'd like, really honestly, and this is the first time you and me have discussed this, do you think we took our eye off the ball with the, with the day-to-day business? 100%. There was so much that we missed. Now, in the short term, we did take our eye off the ball, and I do th- but I do think in the long term, the decisions that we made are the right decisions that will lead to a better business and a better Gymshark. But during that six to 12 month period, yeah, I mean, it's certainly, I was much further away from the product, the brand and the community than I would would like to have been and then now I think I mean we've just sort of dived in head first back into the deep end haven't we ever since it's been the deal's been complete I mean luckily I don't think it's anything that the consumers or the community would notice I think it's more longer term stuff that generally we work on anyway right so it's not like they would have seen our social media posts change just because we weren't as involved in the day-to-day because I've, I've, I've said this before on another one of your videos and I'll say it again like we aren't the musicians right we're the we're the, the the conductors of the orchestra to a certain degree so I don't think anybody would have noticed it it's more the you know the longer term plans and the, the involvement of that but like you said I think we've jumped back on it in a timely manner and now we know sort of better than ever now that we've got GA involved and we've been through a process like that sort of what direction we need to head in you know what I mean yeah yeah no I, I agree um like you say, now since it's been done, we've we've completely got realigned, and now we are pulling in the same direction. So it will it will pay dividends down the line. Is the right thing to do. Um, but you're right; it's allowed us now to think. I think we can definitely think further ahead, um, which I think is important. So from my from 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 my chair and my job and all that, where I sit, for those who don't know, I'm chief brand officer or CBO at Jim Shark. Like, I feel like the attention the business got, we all got around the deal was like ridiculous right like we, we were absolutely everywhere doors that previously i was banging on are now wide open and you're allowed to come through Do you know what i mean by huge people out there that i massively respect big brands who want to work with us Do you know what i'm saying like the world is our oyster kind of thing you have that to contend with in your professional life but then also the added thing of like ben francis billionaire rhetoric do you know what i mean now you're not a billionaire but the way the media paint it and the headline, that's, you know what I mean, that pizza boy turns billionaire is the, is the great hook and story and all that kind of, so, you know, as we, as we know, the media aren't crazy about the facts. It's just, it's just what, what makes a good story. What's that been like? Because I've been, in, I've been in restaurants with you where we're sat together having a normal conversation and next to you, I can, next to us, I can hear, billionaire, Jim Shark, unicorn. 
And it, like, that's a bit strange, isn't it? You, you're sort of, you're erring on the edge of celebrity status there. So take me through that. So from a personal point of view, what was it like getting that much attention on the, on the business and on you personally around that time? Um, I mean, to be honest, I think it was probably helped, well, for two things. One, I don't do a fat lot outside of work. I live a very simple life, as you well know. But secondly, as well, being in lockdown, there was just, there wasn't too much going on. Uh, online, everything blew up, right? From Instagram to YouTube, the comments, the messages, LinkedIn, everything just went wild. Um, so yeah, it is, it, it, it is a weird experience. Um, ultimately, my biggest focus is Gymshark. It ha always has been in it and you know, it always will be. So I try not to let that be a distraction. There's, there's definitely distractions. There's definitely like, you know, there's, like you say, there's a million opportunities, maybe people offering me opportunities or asking for support and help. And obviously I, I'd like to get involved in what I can, but equally I need to sort of be a little bit selfish and focus on, I guess, my own personal life and make time for that, but also make sure I am focusing on, on Gymshark professionally because, I mean, ultimately, whereas other people see this as almost being like the you know the not the end but this is you know this is the great this is this is the this is the thing that happens when you've almost done it or completed it or achieved what you wanted to whereas we see this as just the beginning like there's so much more scope for Gymshark the community and the way that we're building this business um so yeah I don't want to get caught up in too much I guess too much noise outside of what I do at Gymshark and do you do you have to make a conscious effort to suppress that stuff so again I heard you say on the True Geordie podcast and I was sort of reviewing it that he was asking what it feels like to be the owner of a of a billion dollar plus business and you know what if you start thinking about what that's technically worth and what you could be worth and that kind of stuff i think it's easy to sort of i don't know become complacent whatever you want to call it do you make an almost conscious effort to suppress that and be the same sort of young lad that you've always been or do, or does it come fairly naturally to you, you just no, don't think that, that definitely comes naturally um at the moment, back in like go back several years when Gymshark first started and we started doing well and I was in my early twenties, I definitely sort of got a bit excited then. Um, but having yeah, great people on, 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 on that helps. for a second, let me let me talk on that for a second. When you and me first met, you were more typically what I would expect a young lad who'd made some good money to be. Right? Mm. Like the way you dressed, you drove a really really nice car, all that kind of stuff. And then I felt this like. I don't even know what you want to call it, but I, you can probably put it better in terms. But then I, I was very aware of this conscious, conscious switch that you almost flicked to go, yeah, actually, all this stuff that you, you normally sort of associate with money isn't, isn't relevant to me and I don't like it. And you, went, you almost went back to like, same pair of shoes every day, just car was just a means to an end. It was, you, you, you had a very standard car that was always messy and whatever else. Like, was, that, was that a thing for you? Because I feel like most people who probably look up to you think about all the lavish things that your life could afford them. But knowing you, you're really not like that. But there was a moment where you nearly went there. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I, um, yeah, I think it's because when you're a kid, like I said, didn't come from a massively wealthy background. We're not, we weren't like, you know, massively struggling but equally we weren't massively wealthy so all of a sudden there was a load of things that I could have which I could never I, I could have things that previously I could only even consider in my wildest dreams so I thought all of a sudden it's like oh wow I can have all these things and you sort of do this thing where you you know you do you spend a bit of money you have them and then you realize that those things are fleeting they're not giving you genuine joy or happiness you know they are fleeting and there's you know much better ways to spend your time and money um, so yeah, you're right. I just sort of, I guess I, I gave it a go. I, I, I fell into the trap of doing what I think other people think you should do um, because it was just this thing that I never thought I would have and all of a sudden I did. Realised that there was actually not much long-term enjoyment to it and I guess just went back to sort of standard Ben who, you know, you're right, just grew up. I always sort of worn the same clothes, same shoes, whatever, live a fairly simple life. Um, and that's the way that the rest of my family is as well. So yeah, I would say this is me just being chill and normal and happy and comfortable in my own skin. And I suppose, and there's, well, there's other people who've also obviously sort of benefited slash sort of come to, come to win off the back of this process as well, which is obviously like um, Paul and Steve. I know something that people were wondering was, you know, was that, was there any sort of, Steve sold chairs as part of this, Paul sold chairs as part of this. Was that a conscious thing that you wanted them to do or sort of asked them to do? Or was that, a, was that a thing that those guys sort of, you know, wanted to realize themselves? No, so, so basically the way that it worked is when we realized that we would need to bring on an investor to help grow the business, 
is we basically said we want to allow an investor to purchase somewhere in, in, in this sort of region. So it will be in the, in the 20% sort of region. Now, obviously, that 20% needs to be then made up. I think we, we ended up selling a little, a little bit over that. That 20% needs to be then made up from the shareholders. Um, the conversation with me, me, Paul and Steve was, you know, we'll, we'll, I think people had an idea as to where they wanted to, what, how much they wanted to sell. Um, you know, Paul and Steve were, I think, were absolutely buzzing with what they did. And, and that was basically their plan throughout. Um, I was fortunate enough to end up increasing my shareholding, which was brilliant for me. Again, I'm a, I'm a, um, they'll hate me for saying this, but I'm a hell of a lot younger than they are. I've got a lot longer left in my career. So I think they're looking to slow down a little bit, maybe more Paul than, it, than Steve, I would say, in terms of slowing down. Um, so, yeah, I think people, different people have different ambitions at different times in their life. And, and you know, I think, like I said, they wanted to end up, they, they ended up selling what they wanted to sell. Um, the only thing that did come from left, left field was the fact that Lewis also wanted to sell all of his shareholding. And to be honest, I had no idea that he would want to do that until as we were going through the process when we were already moving on with this. Um, so this process would have gone through regardless. And it was only through the process, like calling up Lewis saying, I want to sell all of my shares. It was like, that was a bit like, oh, wow, that was a bit left field. We didn't see that come in. Um, how are we going to juggle this in terms of, you know, fitting in the, uh, fitting that into the slice that we were comfortable selling? So, yeah, let's talk a little bit more on that then, because I feel like people are confused about that. Even like friends of mine or who, who aren't around the business or whatever else will randomly say to me, why would that guy get out now? Surely now is the point where the rest of the world would love to be able to put money into Gymshark. Why would he get out now? You know Lou better than anyone, right? You two are we're, we're very close friends, business partners, all that kind of stuff. He's talked to you a little bit about this, but what's your understanding of why Lou would want to get out now? Um, I think he wanted to close the chapter in his life on Gymshark and move on to the next stage of his life, in summary. Um, he not being involved in the business for a long time, you know, several years, he has much less of an emotional connection to the business than someone like me has, or even you has, someone that's in it every day, knows everyone. I mean, when mm-hmm. Lewis left, we, we weren't at headquarters. We didn't have the LC. You know, a lot of the athletes that we work with today weren't on the team. Um, 95% of the staff, at least, that are currently there today have come since he's left. Um, so he'll have different ambitions, similar to where Paul and Steve have different ambitions because they're at a different stage in their life. I know Lewis wanted to move on and focus on, you know, investing in smaller companies and property and so on. So I think for him, it was a, a case of closing that chapter and moving on to the, on to the next one. Um, and I think he doesn't see a difference in his lifestyle, whether he sells, you know, uh, the for the amount he's sold versus what he might make in a year or so. He just wanted to sort of close that chapter. Yeah, I suppose there's, there's not a lot you can do with 150 million that you can't do with 100 million, right? Yeah, so I think he was comfortable with that. That's cool. And does that, do you feel, now that Lewis is out, is it the same for you? Do you feel like you're happy that you've closed that chapter of the book now as well? Oh, and you yeah. can move on with this new thing? Or is it a shame that Lou still isn't in some way involved because he was there on day one with you, you know, in the garage and all that? Yeah, so on, on an emotional level, it'll be, it would have been great to have him, have him involved throughout. Um, from a, like more of a commercial level, Lewis was owning 20% of the share, holding the business and, and, and doing nothing with it. You know, do you know what I mean? If he was in the business adding value every day, then that's great. Yeah. But he wasn't because he wasn't involved in the business. So to me, it was essentially just shareholding that was held in limbo, really not working for the rest of the business. So, um, I mean, personally, I think it was a win-win. Like I said, Lewis managed to move on. Uh, We've now got a real, um, a a contributing shareholder, as it were. And like I said, I've I've managed to increase my shareholding and have more input and, I guess, control over the business than ever. And that's brilliant for me. And then talk us through. So... That, uh, your your team sent through a bunch of questions b- before this. I want to I want to make that uh, I want to make that obvious so people don't think I'm in some way self congratulatory or whatever else. But one of the things in there was talk us through Noel and others joining part of the shareholding. What was that like for you, and how how did you come to that sort of decision? So that that's something we've wanted to do for a long long time, and you'll know more about this. But the way that the business was structured prior to the deal with the the previous group of shareholders, it just it it, it wasn't almost possible for us to do that. It just wouldn't have made sense whatsoever. So that was one of the huge driving factors for me behind getting this deal done is we could then reset, re- reset with a new structure and bring shareholders such as yourself on, on board. Um, and to be honest, that's brilliant for me because the leadership team who have now got you know shareholders in the business have contributed so much to it over the last few years and will contribute so much over the next few years. 
Um, so it was brilliant for me now to be able to sit around the leadership team table and know that you know everyone's got some skin in the game um, and can really feel emotionally involved. So that's that's brilliant for me, and that's one of the biggest benefits coming out of this deal. Yeah, it's a um, it's a, it's a, it's a super weird moment because, like you said, like shareholding or no shareholding, like so many of us, and I'm not talking about the board. I'm talking about the 500 plus people at Gymshark are so so emotionally invested in this thing. Like when people ask me, like how Gymshark have done what they've done. And depending on who you are in the world, I think people have different reasons why they think Gymshark has succeeded. If you work in influencer marketing, you think it's because of influencer marketing, right? If you work in social, you think it's social. If you work in that, because we do a lot of things well, do you know what I mean? But the only one thing I can put my finger on and say, I can't really, I can't really point out one thing bar this, and that's this shared ambition that every single person has for this to be like the biggest brand in the world. Do you know what I mean? Like. I felt it back in the days when I used to consult for Gymshark when there was like 12 employees on a car park in porter cabins and I feel it today with 500 people in GSHQ and Denver and Hong Kong and all that. I feel this, we're a part of this story, we're a part of this thing that's happening in the world. Do you know what I mean? It's not like a job. So yeah, I mean, the, I, know, I know everyone feels like that and then I suppose for, for those guys who have joined the sort of the shareholding group now, it's, it, that's, that's, even more, that's even more sort of contributing to that feeling, if that makes sense. Yeah. No, I think it's exciting. It's nice to have, like I said, have the leadership team a part of it. For those people who don't understand, and I completely get why, I probably wouldn't if it wasn't for the, you know, what I do. Um, have you got one billion pounds in your bank account? <laughs> no, far from it. So I just want to be clear, right? So the way that this works, because I'm frightened by how many people have asked me this question, because and it will be because of the, the misleading sort of articles that were sent around yeah, yeah. the UK. What they will do is get the company valuation at one uh, in dollars, one point four five billion, and then they will multiply that by 0.7, uh, owning seventy percent of the uh, of Gymshark shares, and then they'll say, right, that is the, the the worth of the individual, or that's you know that's the value of them, or whatever. That doesn't mean that cash sits in the bank account as such. All that means is the shares should be worth that if they were to be sold now. It's you know Gymshark isn't for sale, so that's that's just not a thing. It's it's a fictional figure that's just put against the the business essentially. And it, to be honest, it's a, it's a big headline. It you know it gets clicks, it gets views, and so on. So I think that's why people use it. Um, but no, I absolutely do not. Uh, I think it's quite misleading to be honest. Yeah, it is. And like again, knowing you personally, I feel I feel like people would be almost like a little bit disappointed if they met you that you don't fly in in a private jet or pull up in a Ferrari or any of that kind of stuff. Do you know what I mean? Like you you drive. The, the thing is, I can't like stress this enough, is that particularly where I'm at now, and I'm fortunate to be in this position, I in no means, in, by no means at all, do any of this for money. Like, I don't have to, I don't want to, I do this for the complete and utter joy and the, the ambition to leave a legacy and be, a, be part of something that's bigger than me. And I think that's why a lot of people join Gymshark, back to what you mentioned earlier. People want to be a part of something special, a part of something that's bigger than themselves. And that's the exact reason that I'm a part of this and uh, I'm so passionate about what we do. But was there a point when you did this for money? Was that everything? Um, so I think, so if I look because back to when the we reason, first started, The reason I asked that, by the way, the reason I asked that is because I feel like it's okay to sit there now, now with yeah. your current net worth and go, I'm not in this for the money, do you know what I mean? But when you were working class young kid, was there a point then when you wanted to do it for the money? Just have a little drink and think about it if you want. <laughs> Um, one sec, let me just... <laughs> See, if, if this was a normal Ben Francis vlog, this would have not made it in. <laughs> oh, Perry, you can edit this bit. <sighs> no, see, you shouldn't do this. You shouldn't, you shouldn't, you shouldn't edit these bits out. This shows that you're human, man. <laughs> Edit this out, Perrot. No, because it's just it's such a fucking weird conversation to have. But yeah, so when the when the brand first started, I wanted I just wanted to be involved in fitness. Now, was I particularly happy earning four pound ninety an hour at Pizza Hut? No, no, I wasn't. And I had ambition to do more. So yeah, I mean, to a degree. But then I think you get to a point where it's like the motivation is you do want to be in a you know a more financially free position. You want more opportunity. You want more fulfillment. And then it gets to a point where it's like. Right, I'm I'm very comfortable and happy with what I've got now, and the, everything beyond this is is a bonus. To be honest, yeah. um, like I said, I, I mentioned in the True Geordie podcast. Personally, I've got ambitions around 
supporting people. Like I said, my, my professional ambitions are around uniting the conditioning community and doing the best that I can by the fitness industry. Personally, I, I've got a million other things that I want to do that I know you're well aware of and also share the ambition of like equality in terms of giving kids the same opportunities that other kids have from a creative standpoint. Like one of the most fundamental and life changing things that happened to me was doing a BTEC in IT, not because of the subject, the teacher was brilliant, the subject was brilliant, but because it gave me access to the Adobe Creative Suite that wasn't via LimeWire. Like I want other kids to have that opportunity. So that's where my passions lie. So at the start, was there an ambition financially? Yeah, I think there was, um, but there certainly isn't any more because I'm so happy and comfortable with where I'm at and I've got so many more uh, bigger goals, I would say. There's a, there's a podcast. I don't know if you're like me. I have certain podcasts, which I will always watch again. It's like a part of my life. I'll always go back and watch it because they were just great conversations. Um, there's like, there's, there's Joe Rogan ones. Uh, there's Jordan Peterson ones that you've sent me. And mm-hmm. there's, there's one called Talking Funny. And it's Ricky Gervais, Chris Rock, Jerry Seinfeld, and Louis C.K. sat around talking about being comedians. And I respect comedians so much because I think they have to be insanely intelligent and they're like the best public speakers ever, right? But they said a thing about how they got started in, in, um, in comedy. And their ambition, every one of them said the same thing. I never wanted to be this rich, famous comedian. I just wanted to be one of those guys. It was like I was looking at the, the, the comedy world and being like, I'd love to be in that crew. I'd love to be one of those guys. And when I hear you talk about your early days, I can almost picture you walking around body power thinking that. Do you know what I mean? I just want to be a part of this. Yeah, exactly. And then whatever that came with was, you know, great. 100%. Like, my, like the people I looked up to, Greg Plipp, Scooby, Scott Herman, the OG fitness people, and then came through more of the early Gymshark athletes, Lovado, Ogus, Alan Gabay, people like that, Lex. So, yeah, I mean, they were my inspiration back in the day. It's funny hearing you talk about Greg Plitt because I feel like most people, and Scooby and those guys, because most people these days who are, you know, in the fitness industry wouldn't have a clue who those guys are, but they were the, they were the influencers before there was influencers, weren't they? Yeah, they were the OGs. And that, that was a really great time because there was no ulterior motive to getting into YouTube or anything like that. People just did it purely because it's what they loved and what they were passionate about. And I think that's really cool. Yeah, there was no, I think, go, it's, we're kind of going back to the money conversation there, right? But now people have seen the money in being an influencer or a content creator or whatever else and go into it for those reasons, whereas those guys are just genuinely just sharing on the internet, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I know for, I'll tell you what was really weird moment in all of this, and I've recounted this to loads of people since. You sent me a, a little infographic on Instagram, which freaked me out, and I think you sent it me because it freaked you out as well, which was about how long it took like IBM and Tesla and Apple and some of the biggest companies in the world, like, you know, game changing brands, how long it took them to achieve unicorn status. And it was long, it was a good bit longer than seven years, wasn't it? I mean, in most of the, uh, in most of the examples. Our, our growth has been rapid. And I think like naturally because of, you know, uh, the, the change in value of money over time and just the, I guess the digitalization of the world that we're a part of, it's going to inev- inevitably get quicker. Um, but yeah, we were so quick and the growth's been so rapid, like fastest growing company in the history of the West Midlands, which is the region that we're from. What are the UK's fastest growing company a couple of years ago, fastest growing revenue, fastest growing profits. We've, you know, we've, we've almost seen it all. Uh, and the journey has been insane, absolutely insane. And, and by the way, to do all of that without borrowing money. So I think we're, I think we're the second company in the UK to have ever done it got to a, a billion dollar valuation without borrowing i think the one company that previously did it was a pharmaceutical company and there you know it works in a slightly different way so the first consumer brand to do it and i don't even think in the world there are very many that have managed to get to the unicorn valuation as we term it without borrowing because the, the mentality in, in in some businesses is almost build a dream or a plan get an investor spend the money get an investor and, and you know grow in that way and that's a it's a, just a different way of doing it i'm not saying it's better or worse but it's, it's different and to completely bootstrap the business like this that it i was I, I was proud of the fact that the first investment in gymshark was from my going back to what i mentioned earlier four pound 90 an hour pizza hut was invested yeah. in the business and it's just snowballed and snowboard and snowboard and snowboard into a 1.4 billion dollar business which is just nuts yeah, that's incredible, though, isn't it? When you say it like that, the first investment was a, a you know like a, a a minimum wage like a savings account, and the second one was General Atlantic and Unicorn Status. Mm-hmm. Incredible. Um, well, so that that kind of brings us to now, right? Obviously, the deal's done. 
We've had GA on the board now for three months, four months, something like that. Um, has it, how, how has the business changed internally for you? Or, well, how, how have things changed since GA have been in board, on board at the company? So day to day, I think you, anyone in the business would say the same. It hasn't actually changed a fact. Like you probably wouldn't notice anything. So people from GA aren't in the business. Their local office is in London, which is you know an hour and a bit on the train away. Um, it's been really useful just to be able to sort of check things by them. So there's already been several mistakes that I think we would have made in terms of our expansion and so on that we've just gone, hey, guys, I know you've done this before. What's your thoughts on this? Can you give us some feedback? And they've done that, you know, without being intrusive in any way, shape or form. We go to them when we need help rather than them pushing it in on us, pushing it on us. So I think that's been really useful. But day to day, you wouldn't notice any difference whatsoever. Um, and like I said, because of the new share structure, because of my increased shareholding, because Lewis has moved out of the business and everyone that's holding shares is productive in the business, we can be even more agile than ever before. And I think that's really powerful. Weird question, actually, well, as you say that. Was, that. was it important to you that you put the new share structure in your video and you, you gave the, the consumers that transparency about who did hold shares? Because... First of all, you never told me you were going to do it, so that was an interesting surprise. <laughs> and then, and then I remember thinking, I remember sort of sitting there watching your video and thinking, "Oh wow," and then thinking, actually, like, I think that's a bit of a genius move. And I think if we want to be transparent, that's a really, really great idea. But what, what was your thought process behind doing that? So there's two. I think there's two things to this. Is that well, one, we want to be as transparent as possible as a business, both both in the front end, but also the back end. And I know that a lot of people follow this channel and follow me because they want to understand how the whole thing works. And I think people are unnecessarily secretive about things like that. And I don't want us to be one of those brands. I think by being transparent, we can help even more people. And like I said, I've had so many messages from you know business owners across the world that have you know, said thank you for that because it just gives context to everything else that's going on in the business. Um, but I mean, ultimately, I want us to be as transparent as possible. And it's, I think it's tough to sort of pick and choose when you want to be transparent. So to just be utterly transparent, this is the deal. This is what happened right from where our head was at to, you know, the shareholder and the business. I think that's really important to me. That's cool. I suppose now, again, personally, for a lot of us, it's really weird that Ben Francis has become this like revered Richard Branson style figure. Um, but you have, I think, and, and sort of somewhat inadvertently as well, do you know what I mean? Become this like very respected icon, British entrepreneur, do you know what I mean? All that sort of stuff. Um, so you now, I'm guessing a natural sort of responsibility has fallen upon you to like set a really good example to like young entrepreneurs behind you as well. I definitely feel that pressure. And going back to Jordan Peterson, you mentioned earlier, he talks about responsibility gives meaning in life. And I definitely definitely agree with that and i feel that massively what do you mean by that as in ten, the more responsibility that you can hold whether it's you know i mean like i said so if i go back to when i was a kid working at pizza hut i had no responsibility i had no dependence i had i could do whatever the hell i wanted and i had utter freedom to go to work or not or ha whatever i wanted in life within reason right i couldn't maybe afford some of the things that i can today but i could do whatever the hell i want Whereas now I've got way more responsibility. I've got a responsibility to the other shareholders. I've got a responsibility to, you know, my colleagues. I've got a responsibility to, you know, my family at home and a responsibility to make sure that I'm giving Robin enough time and, uh, and so on. So, and with the more responsibility I've taken on, whether it's people management or, and, and so on and so on, the more, I guess, the more meaning I feel like I've got in my life, the full, more fulfilled I am in everything that I do. So that, that's something that's definitely re like struck a chord with me that I read in Peterson's book. Um, so yeah, and, and, and like I say, me being in this position, which I think is at the forefront in many respects, particularly a British business, you know, I get the opportunity to meet, I had a meeting this week with, you know, some top people at government, with people like Theresa May, um, like that's mental. I never thought I would have that opportunity. And I can, in many respects, be the spokesperson for a lot of the small businesses or other businesses that we interact with. And I think that's really important to me and powerful. Um, and that's what I mean when I talk about responsibility. Um, and I think that some of the smaller businesses that, look at, that are looking at what Gymshark are doing now will do it because they'll be inspired by us from our, 
you know, the way that we approach sustainability, the way that we approach transparency, the way that we interact with people, whether they're, you know, a fan of the business or the brand. I think that's powerful. And I think we can have a lasting impact on the way that brands communicate with consumers by leading the way and inspiring as many people as possible. So two final questions to wrap up. Number one, young entrepreneurs, you know, e-com businesses, the fledgling e-com businesses that sort of come behind you inspired by what you've done, because obviously there's literally thousands of them. If there's one or two things that you want them to take from you and your journey, what's that? Um, oh God. I mean, I keep going on it and it's such a corny thing to say, but you definitely have to do what you love because if you don't, like I was so passionate about fitness and I still am to this day, right? Like I'm lifting regularly. I, I absolutely adore it and love it and it's changed my life. And I think that's the reason that I've been able to get through or we've been able to get through some of the the, the darkest days and the most difficult times. Um, and the second thing from more of a business perspective is just how important self-awareness is. I think you have to be really critical of yourself as to what you are good at and what you're not good at. And I think so many people just don't do that. I think they draw what they want to be a little bit more than what they are. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's really, really important for success. And then with that, it'll allow you to surround yourself with, with brilliant people. Last question, and this is, this is a deep one, so get ready for this. Subscribers, lean in, everybody get ready. Um, what are you more fearful of? Nike, Adidas, Under Armour, Lululemon, etc., or the next 19-year-old kid in the garage? you know the answer to that all day long it's like we we i mean i wouldn't really look at some of the bigger brands it's you have to constantly be thinking about during a when you're well, i mean we're alive in a period where there's probably been more change than you know many other generations we've seen in many respects the digital revolution the social revolution and you know there's plenty more to come in the next few years um we're way more aware of what's going on by, like you say, the, the 14, 15, 16 year old kids sat in their bedroom building that next thing than, than what we are, what some of the other larger brands are doing. There you go, everyone. That's the, uh, that's the second podcast. Make sure to like, comment and subscribe and uh, any other further videos you wanna see from Ben or you wanna see us have conversations about in this sort of format, um, make sure you comment them below. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this weird way we didn't want to just screen record a zoom because i find them horribly jarring to watch i think ben's the same uh, and this one was inspired by kano and his newham talks so uh yeah let us know if you like the format of the the podcast below as well parrot see ya <laughs>